Okay, so this might lead you to wonder, are we always going to have perfectly elastic horizontal market supply curves in the long run? In other words, are we always going to have a problem like the one we just did, where at some price, right, for burritos it was P equals 10? We can just have burrito shops enter or exit the market as demand increases and decreases without ever changing the price of a burrito. So the answer to this is no. There's two reasons that even in a long-run equilibrium in a perfectly competitive market, we might not have perfectly horizontal supply curves. So the first reason is that we might not have identical firms. So the example we just went through, right, my burrito shop and your burrito shop and the next burrito shop all have exactly the same production technology. So if I'm earning zero profit, you're earning zero profit, and the other burrito shop is earning zero profit. But in the real world, we might think of lots of examples where there's firms that are producing identical output, right? Consumers don't care who they're buying from, but the firms themselves might have different production technology. So as an example, let's imagine that we wanted to think about the oil industry, right? So we can imagine we've got, just to make things simple, let's say we've got three firms that produce oil, right? So we've got um, oil production in Saudi Arabia, right? Some firm in Saudi Arabia that can produce oil very cheaply. This is Saudi Arabia. We've got oil production in Texas, which let's say is a little bit more expensive. And then let's say that we could produce oil in the tar sands of Alberta. Cool. Now the important point here is we've got a bunch of different firms. In reality, instead of three, we might have five or seven or a million different firms, right? All with slightly different values of oil reserves. And all of them can freely enter or exit the market, right? So the Alberta firm might decide to produce oil, might not decide to produce oil. Where if the price is below their reservation price, they won't produce any oil. Same with the Texas firm. What we can't do though, is just endlessly reproduce the Saudi Arabian firm. In other words, right, free entry and exit doesn't mean that we have an, an infinite number of oil reserves as good as the reserves in Saudi Arabia. So let's think about what our market supply curve is going to look like. It's basically going to be, right, as we saw before, we're going to add these three curves horizontally. So our market supply is just going to be the same as Saudi Arabia, up until Texas enters the production, right? At which point it'll be Saudi Arabia plus Texas, up until Alberta enters production, right? At which point it'll be all three, right? So we'll end up with a market supply curve that looks something like this, right? Just horizontally summing these three different firms. And if we think about the zero profit condition, a way we can think about this is, let's say that we had a price like this, right? If we had a price like this, we would say Saudi Arabia is gonna be making money, right? They're getting a producer surplus. There's an area above their supply curve and below the price. But Texas isn't making any money at all. Right, they get zero producer surplus. And Alberta is out of the market entirely. So one way to think about this is, Texas is right on the edge between entering and exiting the market. Right, For the marginal firm, the firm that's just on the border of being in the market, the zero profit condition is satisfied. If the price fell a little bit, they would leave the market because then their profits would be negative from being in the market. And if the price was a little higher, right, if the price went all the way up to here, then Alberta would enter the market, right? So the zero profit condition would be satisfied for that marginal firm. However, each individual firm is gonna be earning profits, right? If they're more productive, if they have lower production costs, than the firm that's on the margin. So we can end up with an overall market supply curve that's upward sloping because of the fact that as we have new entrants into the market, those new entrants are slightly less productive or slightly lower quality than the entrants that were already in the market. 
Now, one reason I want to show you this is because this brings a really important insight about when we expect firms to be profitable in a competitive equilibrium, which is the only reason in this case that Saudi Arabia could be profitable in a competitive equilibrium is because they have access to some resource that their competitors lack, right? They have access to higher quality oil reserves than their Texas competitor or their Alberta competitor. So even though there's nothing stopping those competitors from entering the market, those competitors can't bring the price down to the point where Saudi Arabia would be breaking even. Another way to think about this, right, is that the profits that Saudi Arabia would make, say at a price P1, are given by this area here. One way to think about this profit, and one way to preserve kind of thinking that firms in competitive equilibrium should make zero economic profit, is that this profit is really the value of their oil reserves. Right? In other words, when we've calculated their cost functions, we've thought about capital and we've thought about labor, we've essentially said that the oil reserves just make the firm more productive. If instead we'd said that oil reserves were an input in production, this profit would essentially be the value of those oil reserves, the amount we'd have to pay to get access to those oil reserves. Another way to say this right, is that if Saudi Arabia sold their oil reserves to the Texas firm, right, if they swapped access to oil reserves, they would just swap production functions. Right? So then, if Texas had the better oil reserves, it would be Texas that would be making that economic profit. In this case, right, this could be, we call this profit rent. And the idea is, this is essentially the benefit you get for owning some fixed resource. The same way that if I own an apartment and I rent it out, I get rent. Right? In this case, that's a physical resource right, that I actually can buy and sell on the market. If we think about non-physical resources, things like managerial talent, or workplace culture or something like this, we can still think about the economic benefits of those things as being a form of rent. So that's one reason that we might expect to have upward sloping supply curves in a competitive equilibrium, is because we've got different firms, firms that are different from each other, and as we increase the price, we get lower and lower quality firms entering the market. Another reason that we might have upward sloping supply curves in a long run competitive equilibrium is because input costs might not be constant. In other words, as we increase the, mar the scale of production in the market sense, we might increase the costs of the inputs that firms need. So to think about this, right, to make this concrete, let's think about, instead of thinking about burritos on Venice Beach, let's imagine that we wanted to talk about the market for dentistry. Right, so we wanted to draw a similar sort of story here as we did on Venice Beach. Right, we would say, let's say that there's 100 dental firms in the LA area, and collectively they have a supply curve like this, right? This is for 100 firms. Right, we've got a demand curve like this. We've got some price Q1, some quantity Q1. And let's imagine that at Q1, all 100 of our firms are breaking even. Right? So the amount that they pay to hire dentists and hygienists and offices is exactly equal, right? Their average total costs are exactly equal to P1. So now let's imagine that we've got some sort of a shock to demand, right? Demand increases. One way you might think about this, right? We've all been staying home, not interacting with other people during COVID. We don't care if we have bad breath anymore because no one can tell. So we're letting our teeth rot out of our face, right? Once we start being allowed to see people, we freak out, we really want to go to the dentist to fix all of the problems we've inflicted on ourselves. So we go from a demand curve like this to some higher demand like this. Right? So far, this is exactly the same story as we told about the burritos. Now, the problem we're going to run into, right? As we talked about with the burritos, if we stay on this demand curve here where we have 100 firms, we would say, well, at this point, we're going to be earning economic profits, right? We have some higher price. So we expect to have more dental firms enter the market, right? If we had the story go exactly the same way that our burrito story went, we would have firms enter the market until here, right? We would keep the price at P1 and just expand the level of production, right? But there might be a problem here. There might be a reason that we can't get away with this in this case. And that is, if we wanted to increase the number of um, dental visits, right, from Q1, let's say 1,000, 
to 2,000. We're going to need more inputs. We're going to need more dental chairs. We're going to need more dental hygienists. And we're going to need more dentists. Right? If we have constant costs, right, at the firm level, we're going to need twice as much of everything in order to produce twice as much output. Now, this was true in the Brito case as well, right? But in this case, we might worry that doubling the number of dentists in the LA area might not really be feasible to do. We might not be able to find twice as many people as are currently working as dentists who are qualified for dentistry and interested in dentistry and willing to earn the current going wage for dentists. In other words, what we might expect is that if we look at the market, right, so this is the market for dentistry. If instead we looked at the market for dentists, right, where we have some wage and we have some number of workers, we might think that our labor supply is upward sloping. Right? In other words, if we want twice as many dentists, we might have to pay more money in order to get twice as many dentists into the market. And if this is the case, right, then expanding output from Q1 to Q2 means expanding demand from de for dentists from some lower level to some higher level, and therefore increasing the wage that dentists are willing to pay, or are, are going to be paid. Well, what happens when we increase the wages of dentists? What happens is we increase the costs of all of these dental firms. So if they've been breaking even at a price of P1 before, now each dental firm on the market is going to only be able to break even at some price at some higher price, like P2, right? Where the exact value of P2 is going to depend a little bit on how much wage increases as we increase the number of dentists, how we increase the number of dentists we need as we increase the quantity. Right? The result might be that there's some higher price, P2, that actually sets an equilibrium here. Right? Where in order to get enough dentists to work, we need to pay a wage high enough so that firms only break even when they're earning more money. Right? So as a result of this, right, as a result of the fact that we're actually going to have this shift backward in our supply, given the increased price of dentists, it might be that instead of being able to draw a straight line here, Right, saying that we're going to supply the same the um, any amount of dentistry at some price P1, we're going to actually end up with a long run market supply curve that's sloping upward. Not because any firm is making money at any of these quantities or any of these prices, but because as we're expanding the quantity, we're making the inputs in production more expensive, and therefore increasing the price that allows firms to break even. So we might have a long run supply curve like this, market supply curve. Now, a really important point that I want to make about this, right, this upward sloping market supply curve, what's not happening is that any particular firm is unable to hire dentists in the earlier or the later equilibrium. Each particular firm can hire as many dentists as they want at the going wage. The problem is that the market for dentistry is changing in a way that's increasing that going wage at which firms can hire dentists. And that's driving up the minimum, the minimum price that allows them to stay in business. Now, I wanna make another point about this. I wanna ask you a question. So in the Texas and Saudi Arabia and um, Alberta example, right, we said that there was gonna be a producer surplus from this upward sloping supply curve. And the reason was that Saudi Arabia, for example, was gonna make money. Right, they were going to be profitable as a result of having lower costs than their competitors. In this case, at a price P2, graphically, there's also a producer surplus. Right? We have this whole area here above the market supply curve and below the price. But we're saying that all these firms are identical, and we're saying that all these firms are breaking even, not making a profit at a price of P2. So what's going on with this producer surplus? How can there be a producer surplus in a market where firms aren't making any profit? So what I would argue is that what's going on here, what's happening with this producer surplus, is that it's going to dentists, right? The reason there's a producer surplus here is because input costs are rising as we're increasing the scale of output. And that is basically shifting us from this equilibrium to this equilibrium. 
So the dentists are earning this producer surplus, right? That's increasing the cost of firms. So this producer surplus is exactly equivalent to this producer surplus. Does this make sense? So the reason that the producer surplus is no longer going to represent profit is because in this graph that we've drawn, we're not holding the firm's costs themselves fixed, right? We're allowing the change in quantity to have effects on the input prices of firms. And this is something, by the way, trying to understand these linkages between markets and what these producer surpluses mean given those linkages is going to be our focus next lecture. Okay, so I just want to hit you with one more thing and then I'll get out of your face, let you go about your life. Which is, in the last example we gave, right, we said that because input costs increase, as we increase the scale of production, we're going to end up with an upward sloping market supply curve. So I want you to think about, would it ever make sense to have a downward sloping market supply curve? In other words, if we think that firms are going to produce, right, we're going to have a price where firms are breaking even, where firms are just on the border between producing and not producing, and so it's driving the, the supply curves to be upward sloping or downward sloping is input costs. Is there ever a situation where changes in input costs could actually reduce the costs of production for a firm? I'm going to argue that in fact there are such cases. So as an example, let's imagine that we were thinking about the North Dakota oil shale fields. Right, so I don't know if you guys know about this. A few years ago, a few years ago, Fracking technology got a little bit better. As a result, there's all of this oil underneath North Dakota that was not really economically feasible to drill for before maybe 10 years ago, but then suddenly became very, very valuable. And as a result, you ended up with all of these oil drilling operations opening up in parts of the country where almost nobody lived, extremely, extremely low population areas. So if you imagine that you're the very first fracking operation in Western North Dakota, right? You've got to get your workers to move out to basically a frozen wasteland, right? Somewhere where there's no grocery store, there's no restaurants, there's no bar, there's no one to talk to, right? And it's negative 40 degrees in the winter. So you might imagine that you have to pay them a pretty high wage in order to live in North Dakota under those conditions, right? So your cost of production might be pretty high if you're not producing very much output. The handful of firms that are there might have a pretty high break even. But then, right, if you expand the scale of production, right, you end up with more firms entering that same area of North Dakota, you eventually have enough population so that your workers can have friends, right, if they bring their families, their, fam their kids have someone to hang out with, somewhere to go to school, you might have a grocery store, you might have a bar, you might have, you know, restaurants, fun things to do, and the wage that you have to pay to get workers to move out to North Dakota might go down. And as a result of that, you might end up with actually lower cost of production than you had before. Right? So if you had some original supply curve like this, given the firms that are initially in the market, so let's say QS P for 100 firms, right? it could be that your supply for the, the prices if you have you know, in some initial demand like this, right? so you've got initial market, market equilibrium like this, if you had an expansion of demand, you might actually have the cost of production falling because of the fact that you now have more firms to share the burdens of running a town with, so that your market demand, I'm sorry, your market supply at a price of P, your long run equilibrium market supply is actually downward sloping, right? This is essentially saying you're in a firm where costs are decreasing with scale, not for a particular firm, but for the industry as a whole. Now, this might seem like a kind of weird example, right? A kind of extreme or strange situation. But this idea that you might have decreasing costs with increased scale is one of the fundamental arguments for why we have cities in the first place. It is exactly because of the fact that increasing the number of people in a particular area makes it cheaper to provide amenities that people enjoy and therefore lowers the wages that people are required to earn in order to live in a particular area. Okay, so that's enough for today. Thank you so much for bearing with me. I can't wait to talk to you about all of this soon.